Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. Today, we're bringing you part two of a fascinating and insightful discussion about digital marketing in general and Google in specific. Back with us today is Steve Kroll, the president of Granular a data-driven digital marketing agency based in Milwaukee. Granular was founded and is run by digital marketing veterans with both in-house Fortune 50 and agency-side marketing experience. Initially joining Granular as vice president in 2015, Steve brought 15 years worth of digital marketing, SEO, consulting, sales, and business experience to the role. And I'm excited to share his thoughts with our listeners again today. Welcome back to OutDrive, Steve. Cliff, great to be back. It's great to have you back. So you've been around a long time and really seen the whole growth in search marketing and really all forms of digital marketing because you have expertise across multiple lines. But what do you see happening right now that you think, wow, this is pretty cool. Maybe it's something we're beta testing or it's something that we've been putting into all of our clients' programs because it's just really working. Yeah, what I would say, man, there's a lot of different developments within Google. I'll start there because that's where I spent so much of my career, SEO, Google, so much energy devoted towards how to help our clients get found organically or how to, you know, show up for the right keywords and, you know, managing against bids and conversion rates. So on that side, the Google ecosystem, you would have probably, anyone who works in this space or is adjacent, they work in an organization, they're an ad agency that touches Google ads. If you haven't heard about performance max campaigns, it's something that is coming. And if you're not actively using it or the campaigns you're working with haven't been upgraded to that style, it's something that is not going to, to change. And to explain it in a broader context, the reason companies like Granular were able to exist and why we're so valuable is the more that you give choice and options and an ability to modify what keywords an ad shows for, when it shows, who it shows to, what combination of words, what page to send them to, the time of day, what device they're using. Anytime you add in that complexity, it creates challenges for people because people don't like too many choices and options. And it would really think of it as it was a platform where you know people would jump in and they would know I can add some keywords, I can write an ad, I can send them a landing page. But if things don't perform well, or even if they start performing well, they were not sure, all right, how can I keep doing more of the thing that works? How do I stop doing the stuff that doesn't work? And so there was all of these different targeting options, but the most important tool that advertisers in Google's ecosystem had, I'll start with search ads, was the ability to really, in a granular way, focus on what keywords trigger a specific ad and making sure that specific ad drives users to a specific landing page experience. And I know it sounds simple, but you know it used to be, I want to bid on this exact keyword, someone typing it in, no keywords before or after, phrase match, you know, I'm willing to bid on these keyword, this word when it's written in a certain sequence and anything before or after, or a broad match keyword, which is if it's the general theme or idea related to this keyword, you're giving Google permission to, to serve the ad. Now they had variations there with broad match modified. I won't get into all the specifics there. And then you have negative keywords, the ability to say, I never want to show my ad when someone searches for certain terms. That was 
basically from the time Google debuted their their platform to the broader public in 2000 through, I would say, the end of 2020. So basically a 20-year run of when, if you're an advertiser, you want to bid on a specific keyword or you don't want to bid on a specific keyword, you had that granular control. You know, really in the last 18 months, two years, you can even expand that to three years when some things gotten tested. Google's really wanted to push advertisers to do two things. They've wanted them to say, look, when you're so obsessed with controlling that traffic in this granular way, you're missing out on opportunity. Basically, they saw that there was this well oil machine with advertiser working with someone like granular. It was essentially a way to to print money and not lose if you were doing it the right way. Hey, we know if we invest in these keywords, you invest a dollar, it's going to yield seven. It's going to yield eight. It's going to yield 10. And the problem is there are all these other keywords that to an optimist, you know, let's say if you're Google, they would say, if you're tracking things in this too direct responsive way, someone searches the keyword, it's too much of a narrow viewpoint on this. There are all these other keywords that play a role in the user journey as they're exploring and figuring out what they want to type in. You're not taking advantage of those searches. And not only are you not taking advantage of those searches, there's websites that are visiting, there's videos they're watching, there's places they're visiting because they've got Android, which is the, the largest install base for for their phone, their open source software. You've got YouTube, which is the most popular video platform in the, in the world's second largest search engine. The display network, which reaches 90 plus percent of the internet. You've got Google Maps, which is the most popular GPS platform. So basically they're saying, there's all these other signals that should be informing your strategy on the keywords you're showing up for. So we think that you should be more open-minded to incorporate those keywords and not have too granular control. That's the optimist viewpoint. The pessimist viewpoint is, they're publicly traded searches where they make so much of their revenue. They can only increase bids so much because it's all based off of competition. It's a supply and demand marketplace situation. And they're saying, we just have all this remnant inventory, keywords, the display network, YouTube videos that we're not, we're under monetizing. So we need to figure out a way to monetize that behavior. So essentially they're saying, yeah, you should incorporate some of these signals. The second is you are only on search. There's a lot of people where you look at granular when we started. 98%, I would even say like 99% of our spend was on search advertising or shopping. We weren't running ads on banner ads. We weren't running video ads on YouTube. Part of it was we didn't have the assets or it was hard to get the good quality assets. But the other part of it was you know, our clients were trained to think of it in this very last click attribution. I invest a dollar here, it should yield X. And Google said, you know, hey, we we need to solve that problem. We need to get people moving on to some of these other platforms we have. So your your question was, what are things we're, we're excited about, things we're, we're seeing? So I talked about PMAX, Performance Max campaigns. This is the latest tool in Google's tool belt, which is really a major step, you know, they've they've done some different things with, you know, the ability to run YouTube specific campaigns, display campaigns, smart campaigns, extending search campaigns on the display network, discovery campaigns. But this is really the first time they've said, hey, we are adamant that if you are an advertiser, you need to be on across more than just search. You need to be Yes, search is a component of it, but you need to be on the display network. You need to be on YouTube. You need to be serving ads on, on Gmail. And so they created this campaign type, which is a catch-all, where you essentially upload your headlines, your descriptions, but you also upload your logo. You upload different images that are relevant, different lengths of headlines, and Google will serve that ad across all these different platforms. And it's optional. You know, you still have your traditional campaigns, but what they did, which was not as transparent, I guess, or it was something that with the benefit of hindsight, people wouldn't have made the choice with shopping campaigns. I'll use that as an example, e-commerce clients, you know, the 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 client we, we, we co-pitched on to work with e-commerce, you know, they had more of a traditional shopping campaign 
setup. But we would have moved them onto what Google calls smart shopping, which is basically the ability to take advantage of these different signals to drive better performance. But it still was pretty similar to the traditional manual shopping campaign structure. Well, what Google did is anyone who had converted or launched campaigns that were smart campaigns, they automatically converted those in August into these performance max campaigns. And there was no ability to pause that. So it was a real surprise to a lot of people. And there's two ways you could choose to react to this. You know, your question was, you know, what are, what are we excited about? There's a lot of people who've had to deal with this where it's the opposite. They weren't excited. They were very negative on it. People don't like change. They don't like when their hands forced. They don't like losing control. Google was really the last holdout of these different platforms where you could get extremely granular with control. I would argue Amazon's that way too still, but of the traditional digital platforms. Mm -hmm. And now you were forced to use, extend your campaigns across all these different places. And if you didn't have a video asset, if you didn't have an image asset, you were now forced to run ads there. I'm excited from the standpoint of you've seen consumers willingness and expectations to have vertical video formats, different style formats to be okay with that. And Google looks at it as Google's not going to change. They're going to continue to lean more in this direction. And so for us, it's all right, instead of saying it's the end of the world, what are the factors within our control, which is we understand our clients, we understand who they're trying to reach. We understand what we're trying to get them to do. What are all of the things that they fear or we fear and to not make a fear-based response, but you know, let's really break that down. All right, we're worried about this, this video ad looking bad. We're worried about this image ad looking bad. Let's create a better asset. You know, if you can't do it, hey, you've got people like Cliff and the team at Callis who can do it, really experienced with that. And it can create a conversation to say, all right, you now have to think about things outside of just search ads. You have to think about things outside of this very narrow, someone goes to Google, they search, they click, they do something and ignoring all the other things that will influence it, like word of mouth, referrals, looking at YouTube videos, researching on, on websites. So I'm excited about that because it is forcing people to into what could be uncomfortable, but it's ultimately the companies who can figure it out, the people who work with agencies like ours, people who are working for the organizations that don't have fear-based response, but they see it as opportunity, they're mm -hmm. going to benefit. So long answer to your question, but that was about as brief as I could be with there, there. There's a lot of stuff going on with this performance max change, but I wanted to properly contextualize it. Yeah, well, there are so many exciting things going on and, you know, it's hard. We see it. I'm sure you do, too. It's hard for the client side to really have the resources to stay up with all these different things and why there's so much value in working with a digital marketing agency, a digital marketing partner to help navigate you through all these different opportunities and to take advantage of the ones that work the best for you. So I think that was a great answer. Lots of opportunities out there and it's all very predictable. Let's change gears here. You know, I think a lot of what you've been talking about with the new things are sort of geared to an experienced digital marketer. What if you're not that way? What skills should a marketer invest in learning if they don't really have the experience as a hand-on practitioner? Yeah, so I'll put the skills into two camps, ones that are transferable regardless if you're in digital and then the one specific in digital. So I think anyone working in a capacity, this could be entry level to owner, C-suite, Skills that are totally transferable that are, are really important is having an ability to write well, communicating super important. It's really important to be able to work on communicating. And again, these sound like very macro compared to some of the other things I've talked about. Super important because even if you're really, there are so many people who are really strong on the, the technical side that work in our space, but they struggle with uh, communicating and selling their ideas or they get lost in the details about what the real big takeaway is. I would say focusing on being a strong writer, focusing on being able to speak and really focusing on brevity and the, what are the things that actually matter. 
I think that's really important. Now, when it comes to digital marketing in particular, I tend to say, don't try and be perfect at everything. Pick your one area and be exceptional. And I would say playing to your strengths. So if you're someone who's inclined towards numbers and data, I, I think it's super valuable to, to focus on the analysis side, focus on analytics. You know, again, I know that there's this transition now from uh, universal analytics to Google Analytics for but this could be regardless of the, the tool itself. It's valuable to be able to know how to aggregate data and then being able to make sure that the data is accurate because when you're looking to surface insights and you're looking to make decisions, being able to say, I've looked at our past customer purchase data, or I've looked at how this web traffic is engaged and this percentage of people are dropping off once they get to this stage of the website, that really is transferable across a lot of different industries. So I would say if you're math, data inclined, analytics is a really smart play. So on the analysis side, analytics, and then I would say focus in an area that is around customer acquisition. Again, we have a bias towards uh, pay-per-click advertising, you know, paid digital, it really the, the ecosystem of how you get traffic, how you get customers, you either earn or you pay for that traffic. And if you're going to focus somewhere, I would say it's best to be really strong at email marketing or be really strong at a very specific component of SEO like content writing or really focus on video as it pertains to a channel to attract traffic. Because if you go to an organization, even if you're in a leadership role, what I've seen really strong marketers be able to do to stand out is they'll have their one area they can contribute in a very direct way. They have deep subject matter expertise. They know the big players. They've run a lot of campaigns there. And if they have a surface level understanding in other areas, then they can really lean on their team. But if they're thinking of job security, if you're thinking of the question of, I know that they, they're the director of marketing, they're head of marketing, but what's their thing they do? It's always valuable to have your one thing that you're known for. Hey, they're really good at email marketing and marketing automation, or hey, they're really strong at LinkedIn ads. That's their area. So, you know, it's tough to say pick one area or one skill. Instead, I would say exposing yourself to the different you know, analytics is super valuable. Absolutely. But when it comes to what can really help you stand out to either getting a job or when people are looking around and saying, where can you cut? And you want to make sure you make that cut. If you have a proven ability in an area where you can acquire customer or acquire leads in a direct way and not just directing people what to do, I think that's that's super important. So um, I would really push, push there. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, sales drives everything, right? And sales comes from customer acquisition. So yeah, I think that's all makes sense. And that's good on a broad scale, writing, communicating, listening is so critical, but you gave some really great advice for digital marketers on you know, kind of where to focus because you can't be great at everything. You don't have time to learn everything. So having that area of expertise is very important. Both of our businesses are based here in the Midwest and we're from here. We're deliberately here. Our teams are here. So many of our clients are here. And when I think about what, what else would be interesting to talk about with this specific audience, who I think would probably over index as, you know, someone who works at a Midwest based company, you know, small size, mid size, large size is, you know, there's lots of perceptions of, you know, if you're a business here, even if you're a decent size, 50 million and above business, you know, companies in the Midwest have been, you know, I think it's easy to paint with a broad brush and say, oh, well, they have a pretty generic website or they've traditionally gone to market through a sales team or trade shows or other means. I think there's still so much that's exciting opportunity on the, the digital front with these businesses because in general, in my experience, these sorts of companies, they have said, if we have to prioritize relationships, customer service, being able to have a reputation as a community partner, and then being really seen as a, a valuable resource within our industry and prioritizing the, the human touch, you know, grip and grand building relationship, 
that has been prioritized with you know organizations in the Midwest if they have to decide if I'm going to invest there versus you know website, email marketing, video marketing. Now there's plenty of businesses who still get by just with that approach, but I think what COVID really did, you know, the pandemic in 2020 when you had you know organizations across all states, you know, from the federal level down to state mandate levels where you know you couldn't gathers groups or you couldn't do trade shows or businesses were choosing to close things is it forced businesses similar to my google example about you know people were not going to make a change unless they were forced to same thing with businesses in the midwest where they'd gone to market traditionally some of those ways i've talked about trade shows in person grip and grin to all right we have to look at how people are finding us digitally You know, these are people doing Zoom meetings and Teams meetings and things for the first time. But, you know, their users, you know, whether they knew it or not, were finding them on YouTube. They were looking up, they were going to Google and they were finding PDFs of their farm equipment that they needed to repair because they typed in a specific part and they saw some website had uploaded a manual or they got there and maybe there just weren't analytics on it. I think where, what, what I would say is that If you are focused on, because I can't know the business that everyone who's listening to this is involved with, but you have an audience who is using Google, who is on Facebook, who's on YouTube, who's on TikTok, who's on LinkedIn. And instead of thinking about it as we need a LinkedIn strategy, we need a Google strategy, we need to write an email newsletter, you really have to think about it in terms of who that user is what problems are you solving for them besides you what are alternatives for how they can address that problem and then asking yourself how good of a job does your current experience digitally do of reaching that user at all stage of the funnel how effective is your website at being able to speak to them having the faqs being able to inspire and educate and uh, encourage them to explore more, being able to ask yourself the question, all right, is there anyone else that is in our space that we admire and forcing yourself to say, why do we admire them so much? I mean, that's part of why Cal's, you've got great tools to take those sort of marketers through that process where maybe, you know, it's an informal process and you can help guide them through, here's how you can actually capture what you admire so much about some of these competitors. And what I would say is really forcing yourself to think through the overall experience and less of we just need a Google ads campaign because we need to drive leads. Now it's easy. I know that's being agency owners, you know, we get lots of requests like that. Hey, I used you guys here at this company. I need you guys to do the same thing for me here. It's easy to just say, yep, we can do that for you. Here's how much that costs. But I think on both sides, that person being able to go to the organization, being open to hearing what is the full opportunity of how they can reach that user. And then on our side, being able to not just say, yep, we can do this thing for you and here's how much it costs. Now, sometimes the thing you start with is that small project and small component, but really being adamant to say, what is that user's experience? You know, So that, that would be my encouragement for businesses here in the Midwest. They're really good at understanding their user, but maybe they just don't put it into those same sorts of terms. It's 2022, so odds are these companies have hired an agency or consultant at some point. But again, there's still plenty of businesses, 20 million and above, you know, 20 million to 50 million, who they would really benefit from working with firms like us, but they've maybe had bad run-ins or bad experience. They've hired a friend of, you know, the owner has a friend who, you know, has a company who kind of does what we do and they do a poor job and then it sours them on the whole thing. But keeping in mind, our users are here. We need to reach them. We need to solve their problems. And hey, by the way, it's going to help our bottom line if we do that. I'm sitting here thinking if an organization, maybe they're kind of a novice to digital marketing or they haven't really invested in a meaningful way this year or maybe ever in the past, how would they approach building a foundation for a impactful digital marketing program? Yeah, there's a couple different ways companies decide on how they're going to make decisions when it comes to 
getting found in their digital strategy. Two that really stand out to me is either a customer oriented approach or a competitor oriented approach. And to go into more detail, a customer oriented approach would be, we don't know anything about digital, but here's who our audience is. And they obviously are buying products from competitors and buying solutions from competitors. How are they finding solutions? Well, they're going to Google. They're engaging with them through websites. They're going to trade shows. I would say that taking an approach of saying, hey, this is what customers are doing. We have the data that shows us what customers are doing and what their preference is when the, re- the full funnel. And we're getting feedback from our customers from talking to them that this is how they're finding companies like us. The other approach is to have just a straight competitor approach. Hey, here's these two companies we really admire or, hey, we don't admire, but we respect them and they're beating us. And I've went, I've gone to their website and they've got a great website. I need to figure out, all right, I don't know everything about what they're doing, but they're clearly doing something well because they're not at any of these trade shows. They don't sign any direct mail, but their team is twice our size. So I need to figure out what they're doing. So usually that's one of the two ways that people go about making decisions. And then when it comes down to what you need to do from a minimum standpoint, yeah, I mean, again, I'll give some very basic advice, but it's good advice. You know, having a website that looks good, it's built on software, it's built on a, on a platform that complies to, to Web3 standards and is crawlable and indexable. There's a large base of people who can support it. That could be something as simple as a Wix or a Squarespace or a WordPress for certain industries, certain small businesses. Now, as you go up in size, you know, for e-commerce websites, you know, that could be your Shopify's, your Big Commerce, your Magento, and then for bigger organizations, even things like uh, HubSpot and, and Pardot and other uh, and Braco, more custom implementations of, of WordPress site core. I mean, those are those are big companies that still comply to Web three standards and. They're really good at making sure that they have base level search engine optimization. Having your Google business profile claimed and your Bing Places profile claimed to make sure that you're telling those platforms, this is our official hours, here's our official website, here are photos, here are reviews from actual customers, super important. We're going to advocate that it's important to, while you're trying to get found, to own your brand terms. So having a simple Google ads campaign where you have a search campaign where you're bidding on your brand terms. I know some people say, why would you bid on your brand if people are already looking for you? Well, if you're getting started, odds are if you're an established industry and you're an established business, your competitors have been bidding on you or your distributors are bidding on you without your knowledge. And if you're a new business, yeah, you need to make sure they find the right Acme Incorporated, especially if you've got a name which a lot of other industries have a name that sounds similar. So I would say definitely do that. Getting Google Analytics installed on your website so you can start to see how users are engaging with your website. Are they hitting dead ends? What content's performing well? Throwing a site chat on there, throwing a phone number on there, making sure that those are trackable conversion events. So that way you're giving users multiple options to engage and get in touch. Having a contact form on a website, anything you can do to personalize the website and make it clear who's who we are, but also here's who we're not. You know, the the more specific that you can be and personalize, big advocate of that, staying away from stock photography where you can. I know with Callus, you make it a point to your clients, hey, let's actually get out and, you know, have your customers feel like they're running their fingers, you know, through the wheat and they're, they're picking up the dirt if they're there with your product rather than I'm grabbing a stock image. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, is it really worth paying that extra money? Well, our data shows it. It actually does make a difference. You'd rather have real photography than, you know, stock photography, even if it's well done here in 2022. So that would be a recommendation. And then put yourself in the shoes of the user. Does it load quickly? Is it easy to access the information? Does it have clear navigation? Those are real no-brainer things. Again, you can get a lot more advanced than that, but you you do those things, you're going to be in a good spot to get started. Well, I hope everybody's been taking notes during this last section because it's sort of like the fundamentals of a marketing plan for somebody going forward. And it's always been my mindset that, you know, marketing is very common sense, right? And thinking about, okay, what do they want? Well, that makes sense. I think what you've described is the elements of both 
common sense and expertise in the digital marketing realm to know what works, what the fundamentals are for getting started, and then how to put that into motion. So would you change that answer at all if you were trying to slant it towards a rural American audience? The thing I'll say as someone who's lived in rural, you know, Midwest and spent a lot of time in rural America, my dad lives in Iowa on four acres in a town that 99.9% of people wouldn't know was in the United States, very small place, that there are certain things that you can do when appealing to this audience that are important. I would say the biggest thing I would say is authenticity. I don't like to paint with a broad stroke. I think we're all more alike than we are different. And, you know, a lot of the good principles still apply. But I would say the the one where maybe in more cosmopolitan markets, uh, metro markets that will be tolerated or expected, where maybe in more rural markets it isn't, is just really leaning into how you're a member of the community, being able to show here's us at the local Main Street event or the softball team that we sponsor or how we're tied in with the schools here. You know, there's there's two ways you can say that you're you're part of that community. You can say you are or you show you are. And, and I think the brands are really effective at serving that, you know, rural uh, America. If you're a brand or the ones who show that they're committed to the to the local community and a lot of stuff that could come off is just so like such a play to just try and like, oh, well, this is like a good marketing strategy to like, this will help ingratiate us if we're a national brand here. In some ways, you're better off leaning into who you are and how you do things and saying, look, we're not from here. There's a lot we don't understand about your community, but we really understand this niche and this product. And this is who we are. I think it's like more insulting if you try and like, change, you know, if you're an outside player and you're trying to appeal to you know, rural America to try and change your brand or change things to like, look like you fit in when it's not really you. That's my opinion on it anyways, that you're just, you're better off being the most authentic version of yourself. You know, JP Morgan Chase, if you're a big bank and you're trying to open a branch in rural America, don't try and pretend like you're the same as like the local credit union there. Doesn't mean you still can't serve that audience, but you have to do it in an authentic way, lean into here are the things that give us the benefit, you know, and here's why we're a good option here. But if all of a sudden you try and make it seem like you're the same as that small credit union or that small town bank, I don't know how effective that is. So, I mean, that's just my opinion though. No, I think it's right on. The authenticity is so important. I mean, you are who you are, right? And so be that and take advantage of that and find your niche and capitalize on that. You mentioned community and giving back and being a part of the community. And we know out here in rural America and, and elsewhere too, that giving back is so important. And I know that at Granular, you have that same philosophy. Has that always been a part of your DNA? Yeah. Look, we have an, an opportunity where we can give back in a direct way financially, as well as with our time and showing that you know the most valuable thing that we have and our team members have is our time so you know putting the time together to do things like blood drive we try every month to do a every couple months i should say to do a habitat for humanity event where we're doing that this thursday a, a group of us we always make it a point not just during the holidays but year round to support lots of different businesses with individuals from different backgrounds for us it really comes down to what our personal values are and being able to extend those to our business and you know telling our team hey this is something that is a good use of our time and our resources to do that and i think it definitely resonates with not just our team but our clients when they see that that's what we're doing absolutely it says a lot about who you are well steve i've certainly enjoyed reconnecting again and doing part two of what really has been a fascinating and I think very insightful podcast mini series. In closing up today, what else would you like to share with our OutDrive audience that you think they might find interesting, educational, inspirational? I'll leave that up to you. The only plug I would give is if you are interested in more content, similar to what I've talked about, you know, definitely listen to the OutDrive podcast series here. There's been other guests I've listened to in the past. You had a great agency owner down in 
Miami recently. So you've got lots of great content there, but also granularmarketing.com. We have our blog. We are always talking about some of the changes going on. Our industry is rapidly changing and you're seeing more and more platforms become ad enabled and you're seeing big changes in first party and third party data. And, and we like to think that we've got a good finger on the pulse on that and uh, have some good opinions and uh, can help guide you through that. Well, folks, Granular in Milwaukee, check them out. They work all over, but they are in the upper Midwest. Good friends of ours. Looking forward to doing great work together in the future. Steve, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Cliff. Hey, folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Steve Kroll, the president at Granular. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCalis.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.